And welcome to another week of Backstage with Cooper and Matthew Johns. Hi. Matt, yep, thanks for the, interrupting my introduction. Matthew, special guest on today, Mark Burris, uh, one of the big businessmen in Australia, very successful, got a podcast of his own. Mm. How long have you known Mr. Burris for? I reckon, uh, what year is it, 2024? Yeah. Uh, probably going on 20, probably 25 years, I'd reckon. Wow. What there, can you tell me about him? Uh, well, firstly, involvement through the footy show. We did when I used to sort of go on there. I remember once going on there in the late 90s and Mark was Mark was on there doing some stuff. Probably the main involvement was when he became involved with the New South Wales State of Origin side. Took over. And that was in the days of Wizard Home Loans, um, which in many ways revolutionised um, as far as home loans in Australia and, and so on and so forth. Anyway, he took over as major sponsor. He was very, very different to most major sponsors. Usually major sponsors for football clubs and, you know, origin sides, they're in the distance. They're separated. Yeah. You know, it's like faceless. You know? Yeah, they're just, yeah. They're just financial, purely. Yeah. Mark was very, very different. He, he, was, a, he was a real presence in the squad. He was almost, well, I'd say he was part of the team. He was incredibly invested. And one of the great things he did was that if the Blues won the series, he would pay for all the players to get a ring, get a, get a State of Origin series win, ring. Wow. He'd pay for that himself. Were you involved in any of the series when he was there? No, I wasn't. No. No, I wasn't. Um, your uncle was, but I was, during those years with the footy show, we had a close involvement there with Channel 9. But we were always sort of in camp and thereabouts and got to know Mark there. Yeah. He's been. A, he's got. He's done a lot of things. Like he's obviously did Celebrity Apprentice, that's the right. first season that's, in Australia. That's so right. I'm keen to ask him about that. Mm. Um, and obviously, just he's kind of went. I suppose from there, understanding. You know, he's got a great business mind for all the young people today. I'm keen to ask him about that. But I'm also keen to see. You know, he's done done a lot of podcasts and obviously yeah. Celebrity Apprentice. I'm keen to see how that changed his life because a lot yeah. of businessmen, you don't, they're probably not as recognizable face wise, but mm. he's one of the guys where he's more than just a businessman now. He's kind of a per Australian personality. That's what it is. And I think Wizard Home Loans changed a lot of that coup. He went from being a businessman behind the scenes to suddenly he became the face of Wizard Home Loans and that increased his profile no end. And yeah, he's done a great job with the podcast. He's got... A very talented guy. Like again, coming back, a lot of businessmen. They're brilliant at business, but they're not great interviewers. They're not great with the media. I did a podcast on Mark's Straight Talk podcast a couple of months ago, and mate, very, very good, very, yeah. uh, very good at interviewing. Yeah, he's done very, it for a while. Yeah, talented, talented guy. And I tell you what, for a guy in his mid sixties, man, I hope I'm looking that good. In my mid -60s. Is he mid sixties? I think so. Yeah, wow. he'd be mid sixties. He's a good-looking cat. Yeah, he looks good. Yeah, he does look good. He looks yeah, really because he looks younger than you. Sorry, he looks younger than you. Okay, let's get on with the interview. Yeah, brother. Right hey, Mark. Firstly, congratulations on the podcast, Straight Talk. Thanks, mate. Fantastic. I'm enjoying it. Who's the first person you uh, you did? On oh, there? fuck me. Yeah, yeah. Am I allowed to swear on the show. Yeah, of course yeah. you can. Uh, I don't know. No idea. We've done like 100 episodes or something now. I've done 550 episodes all up, all my shows. Yep. Sometimes I can't remember who I interviewed last week. You know, that, I, no disrespect to anybody, you know, especially mm. if you're listening. I don't mean that. I mean, I just maybe I'm too busy and I just I don't sort of hold transactions in my head. Because you know Dad's been on your one as well. Yeah, I remember, remember it. That. I remember he came on. I do remember. He had a really tight T-shirt on. That's what I remember. <laughs> he always does. It was really tight, though. Yeah. Like, seriously tight. He was showing the guns off big time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah. Who's impressed you the most, Mark? Well, I had a, a girl there called Angela White, a porn star. She was really impressive. Oh mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> oh, no, you I know, do know her, yeah. Do you know I of do. her? No, I've I've watched her work. Very good. Actually, yeah, I've watched her some. What of on her work. Uh, Pornhub? Yeah. Uh I think it was Red Tube. I'm pretty sure I watched. Yeah, it. I know Red Tube. Same thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, Pornhub owns all those. You know, they're, they're all owned by the same mob. Are they? Yeah, all the same, most of them are the same mods. I can't go through them. XX and X and X fucking blah blah blah. Seems like right across it, Mark. <laughs> by the way, <laughs> no, <laughs> because no, because one of my straight talk interviews, I had the guy who was the head of the CEO and or global CEO of the whole group on one of my shows, and he said we own most of them. Yeah, so, wow. So you think you're watching something different? X Hamster, all those things—they're all the same mob. Ah. Not that I don't watch them, but I have to tell you when sure. I, when I saw the brief for Angela White, um, like I just look at the brief pretty much when I'm sitting out the front there in the coffee shop and because uh, I, I tried to keep it like I don't want to know too much about him but I just thought oh Angela White 
um, and she was on on it said OnlyFans. The world's largest, or she's in the top one percent of OnlyFans earners. She earns ten point five million US a year in subscriptions on OnlyFans. So I thought oh, I better just quickly have a look. Just <laughs> Google her, right? So I Googled her and straight into Pornhub. And there it was, and uh, it was full on. F- I was f- oh, fuck. And then I had, and then I had to go and sort of sit in front of her, like, uh, and she's a, a, a an imposing person, like, uh, physically, big girl, big bosoms, like, strong, good looking, beautifully groomed, and and why she impressed me it wasn't because of any of that, is her professionalism. She turned up with a, a publicist, a hairstylist, a, a makeup artist. And everything she did was on cue. It was like interviewing Donald Trump. Very yeah. deliberate. Totally. A full on business. It's all of a business. And by the way, she's Australian. She lives in LA. But she's, as I said earlier, she's one of the most popular people, porn stars in the world today. It's How'd that come about? Um, she was uh, in Australia for. So a lot of my guests come to us through publicity agents and public relations agents. So she was in Australia to do um, a sex bow in Melbourne. And she was the. Uh, you know, main star for Sexpo in Melbourne, and um, they contacted our production team and asked, "Would we interview her?" So that's sort of we get a lot of those um, from PR people mm. yeah, because we've got a big audience and a varied audience. For straight talk, mostly this happens. Yeah, that's how she got on trying to promote Sexpo. Difficult interviews, Mark. Like, and and what I mean, not necessarily difficult as far as you know their their personality, but like you know, for instance, two that stand out for me, I did Elise Perry. You know, the champion uh, female uh, cricketer, best female cricketer of all time. And, you know, as you know, when you prepare an interview, you prepare for an hour and a half, depending on And she was so unnervingly modest, it was unbelievable. And so you're looking down, and you're going, Jesus, it's an hour's worth of questions. It's only gone 15 minutes. You know, it was real. It, it, it was, and in time, we started talking about superstitions, and she sort of loosened up. But she was just, I've never met a champion who was just so incredibly modest. And the other one was Lauren Jackson, again, the, the iconic um, um, basketballer. And it was, that was so difficult because the vastness of, of her career and her success. I remember get, I read her book, and I'm sitting there, and I was literally having anxiety att- attacks, thinking to myself, how am I going to condense this into a one-hour interview? Well, you, but you're different to me, Matty. So I remember when I interviewed you, one of the things your old man does is he's a mad preparer, mm. like big time, and he's probably obsessive about it. Like you just said, he went and read the book, etc. I just have a conversation. I, I, I do it differently to you. Mm. Oh, that's my personality. But your personality is, if you know, I think if you know too much, mm. it can be a bit overwhelming because mm. you've got everything sort of flowing around in your brain. You're thinking, which where am I going to go with this? Whereas I just tend to have a conversation. So mm. in terms of so for me a difficult interview is some an interview where it's a dead patch, mm. like it's flat or there's no energy or probably worse for me is when they say something that's sort of grabs your tugs on your heartstrings or um, is confronting. But it is that sort of thing is always complex for me, Matty, because I'm not sure whether I should try to show my audience empathy or and sympathy towards the individual? Or should I just move it along and just say, okay, well, the audience is not going to be interested in that. Like, should I be like Mr. Professional, like, you know, Michael Parkinson or someone like that? And then, so I have a conflict. I get conflicted in my own brain. And uh, it t- takes me a while to sort of sort my way through it. Hopefully the audience is getting getting it too, you know. Like it's, mm. uh, you know, you know what I'd love to have? I'd love to, we were talking about it before, but I'd like to have... Um, the two clear is Ivan and Nathan in the, in the room at the same time. Like just see them mm. uh, with each other, how they interact as father and son. Yeah. But dig around a little bit. Like, is he ever giving you backhander? That type of th- stuff. You know what I mean? Like, uh, yeah. do you reckon you were a better footballer than he was? Um, if you had to been given, the, if I said to Ive, if, you know, if you had been given the chance, what he's had, have the <laughs> blokes around him. You never had that, Ivan. <laughs> Would you? Do you reckon you'd been as good a footballer as he was? It'd be interesting. Both of them have what I I'd describe as economy of words, oh, particularly fuck. Ivan. Oh, oh mate, oh. Ivan. Well, he, I, he came on my show, like, and like, I mean, I've known Ivan since he played for us. Like, and uh, he's a good dude, like a really good bloke, and very, very competent. He's very smart. But you're right; he's very economical. Mm. <laughs> very he is. economical. Let's, uh, Mike. You mentioned Donald Trump before. And it just reminded me, talk about the Celebrity Apprentice. 
through that whole thing when he was he was the American boss, you were the Australian boss. Did you meet him? Oh yeah, that's how I got in the beginning. So um, yeah, I, I met Trump um, a couple of times. Um, he did originally before he was president, but originally because um, he owns the show, or he owns part of the show. Yep. So it was sort of like his invention. I think it gets twenty percent of all the royalties, monies that get made for it. It's in twenty five countries. It was in those days, and um, Trump invited me to America um, to come and sort of see how the, the king does it. And um, I remember this is in like 2000 and, uh, 2009. He said, look, he, come up, he came to me through emails. Come on over. I'll, you know, like this is at this stage already agreed to do it. Fano got me into it. Oh. Our mate, it's Fano. It was because he was at um, Fremantle those days. Yeah, Mark Fano, and, yeah. and, his, and his brother. Yep. And, um, and um, I said oh, to Trump, all right, look, I don't really want to come over to America. And he goes, well, he said, um, I'll, I'll send you a business class ticket and you can stay in um, Trump Tower. <laughs> like, whoa. Okay. <laughs> I said, mate, all right, I can buy my own first class tickets if I want to come and I won't be staying in Trump Tower. And uh, he wasn't happy. He wasn't happy at all. Um, but, I, but I met him when he came to Australia. Um, he, he came here for a, I don't know, I think he was doing a talk or something. And um, I was, they told me, the PR people told me, look, whatever you do, when he walks out, we're, we did the interview for Channel 9, actually, um, at the uh, Four Seasons in those days, on the club level or whatever it was. And they said, when he comes through, don't say, hello, Donald, you've got to call him Mr. Trump. You've got to shake his hand. And whatever happens, don't say anything about his hair. <laughs> <laughs> so, so like, he came down with his entourage and security and listen, the, the t cameras are rolling and all sort of stuff. I was standing with the suit on and... He came and looked exactly like he does today, you know, a, a, a solid tie, satin material. I think it might have been a, like a crimsony pink thing and a, a long suit. The tie was too long. S suit, exactly the same. Like, he's amazing. He never changes brand. And as he walked up and the camera's on, I said, G'day, Donald. <laughs> 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 Nearly died. How did he respond to that? <laughs> yeah, right. And, uh, and then, but I didn't say about his hair. And, um, but a mate of mine, two mates of mine, see, before he came to Australia, he asked me, or through his people, could he get a game of golf at the Australian Golf Club? And I was a member of the golf club. So I got my mates to get him a game, two of my mates to take him around the golf course that morning. And they sent me a photo. They got, a, of course, they're going to get a photo of Donald Trump, these two guys. And they sent me the photo of them standing between Donald Trump, on either side of Donald Trump. And the photograph, of course, is very windy. <laughs> and uh, at the end of the filming of the whole show, when it was stopped, when the cameras are off, I said, oh, how was golf this morning? He said, oh, it was great. Thanks very much. You know, like, you know, you relax a little bit. I said, yeah, my mate sent me a photo and I pulled the photo. <laughs> and oh, the the <laughs> 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 he said, and he, but, it, but it was a good human battle. He said, oh, you got me. You got me. You got me. He hates Southerlies. <laughs> oh, so God. do you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, mate, fans don't like the ball jokes, Coop. <laughs> it's funny because it's true. Um, <laughs> while we're on the Celebrity Apprentice, you kind of went from wizard straight into that. What was the comparison in terms of the fame you sort of got from being on The Celebrity Apprentice? Was it a lot different to The Wizard stuff? Yeah, I, I wasn't really... Uh, uh, yeah, The Wizard stuff was more businessy, you know, more, you know, one of the business newspapers write about it. And the, if you call it fame, you know, people sort of thought it was a good deal and I did well and blah, blah, blah. Um, a lot of luck involved in these things, of course. Timing, I should say. Probably a better way of putting it. But... But the apprentice thing was a bit more prying into private life. So, you know, you would get new idea or whatever was around those sorts of magazines that want to talk about you and want to know whether you're married or not married, you've got kids, like mm. blah, blah. And in the end, one of my sons actually came on the show as one of my advisors for a couple of, years, couple of seasons. It's a, the, so the fame is uh, more about um, you're a TV dude mm. and uh, your private life sort of, sort of disappears pretty quickly. Become much more recognisable. Um, I was recognisable in the Wizard Days for what I did. Um, now I'm more recognisable as a person, like your face. And, you know, you, you're walking around and you're prancing around in a suit and you're taking photographs of me and you've got makeup on and all that shit. Um, not my territory, but, uh, yeah, it was a bit confronting, to be honest with you, Cooper. Mm. Yeah, I, I, it wasn't not my cup of tea. Yeah. Who impressed you on The Celebrity Apprentice? Who did you find it? Or who would you employ if you started a business tomorrow? Well... In terms of people who impressed me, uh, Julie Morris was fantastic. So she won one series. Um, yeah, uh, like, Maddie Cooper impressed me. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, I really like Matty Cooper. Um, I liked, uh, I mean, as confronting as he can be, Dermot Burton. Mm-hmm. He was really good. Uh, comedians, generally speaking, we always had a comedian in each series. We always had one or two footballers. Did like uh, Dell was on. Mm-hmm. Like Dell was great, but like he sort of sort of fell. He fell on his feet a few. Like fell over, tripped over a few times. I don't mean literally, but he tripped a few times. The show like that is designed to trip him up. I was impressed by those people who worked out how to not push against the momentum of the show, and the show was designed to make them tired and make them fuck up big time, etc. That type of thing. I was more impressed with those people who worked out how to go with the momentum and uh, make the momentum work for them. Julia Morris, by by far, being the best example of that. And look at Julia today. Mm-hmm. Dicko was really good. He, you know, he's the ultimate professional. He knew how to play it, you know, work it over. You know, and like th- those individuals did quite well out of the show too, by the way. It's, it's interesting you said that, like, uh, Dicko as a person always appears to me is very deliberate. Yeah. He's got an image for himself. A guy who was the other end of the spectrum, who really can rub people the wrong way, I find him extremely entertaining. And every any every bit as deliberate as anyone you meet is Warwick Kappa. Yeah, yeah. You know, well, like, Warwick's mad. Yes. <laughs> no, no, he is. And he doesn't give a fuck. And uh, in the show, he was mad and uh, li- literally mad. Um, and played, he he is, I think he is what he seems to be. Sometimes people sort of act up and perform a bit. But I actually think that's who he is. He is, his, Warwick Kappa is literally mad guy. Cooper's mate. Yeah, he's one of my good mates. No, he. Uh, you mates with him? No, well, that's one way of calling it. He uh, used to come into the Melbourne Storm locker room a fair bit. Um, I don't know who got him in there. I don't even know if he had a, like a pass or anything. He'd just be in there, and he came in one time after a good win, and he was sitting there, sitting in the lock, like he sat in someone's locker, and someone came back after the game and had to move and just sit somewhere else, and he was sitting in there waiting for Belly to finish the speech. And Billy like finished and goes, oh, well, everyone, Warwick Cap is in here as well. Everyone, yeah. And Warwick gets up and he goes, yeah, yeah, boys, how you going? I, uh, I'll tell you a little story about uh, Warwick's got a story for everyone in here. Uh, I met this girl the other day when I was out and uh, she came up to me and said, Warwick, how big is your, how big is your cock? And uh, I told her, four inches from the ground. <laughs> <laughs> and the whole locker room just bursted into tears, eh? But he, but he had a, he had a porn show or something. He did have something. Yeah, yeah he, yeah, he's he, he doing openly said it at the moment. Yeah, no, 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 hundred no, percent. He, he and he told me that he was doing something like that. Like, uh, and he's the guy's like, I don't mean shameful in it. He's he's not shameless in a shameful way. He's just shameless. Yeah, he doesn't, doesn't give care. a shit. Yeah, no, he, he doesn't. He couldn't care less. I, I I'd love to be that way, you know, but I, I can't. I got I got too many gremlins like in my head, you know, from growing up as a Catholic, you know, like. You didn't get Catholic guilt, you know. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. The demons. <laughs> Tell me about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What about what about growing up? You're you're a Westie. Yep. Yeah, you were. What about? Your I mama? used to get called that, by the way, when I was turn to turn up on my board after about two hours on the train. Hey, Westie, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> what did your mum and dad do? Mom? Um, dad was a labourer. He worked in a factory. Um, his whole life until he retired. Um, he worked his way up from that position, but he still worked in the same factory, well, second factory, most of his life. Um. And when he came to Australia, he couldn't speak English. So, and Mum were, and it, so we, therefore never went to school. So he wasn't skilled. And but Mum, uh, my Mum come from a musical family and uh, bookmakers. But my mother worked in the pub. Um, she worked in a pub in Yaguna at night, and then did other things during the period. Like so, yeah. M- m- my my old man would start work at midnight on the milk run. Then at seven, he'd get home at six thirty in the morning. Then he go. And do the work in the factory at seven a.m. because we the factory was right behind our house, and then where we lived. And then uh, he'd come home in the evening, and he and you know he'd have dinner and stuff like that, and had to go to bed early because he's on the milk room. Mum then would go to work at the pub. So I mean, amazing how people stayed together in those days. I mean, that would be a formula today for a divorce or drama. You Isn't know it funny I mean? putting putting um, you ahead of their mar- own marriage? If that makes sense, and. Today it's different though. We have people have more options, I guess. But but I'm, I'm sure there's families who still go through this life this style. I mean, I'm sure there's immigrants in this country today who are doing exactly the same thing just to get by and to make sure their kids can get. You know, I went to a Catholic school. It wasn't expensive. It was you know like it was a cheap Catholic school, and but it was still it was a private private Catholic school. Big for them. I learned how to play the piano. My mother got me piano. We did piano lessons. Me and my brother all our lives. 
um, right up to year 12. Um, we, you know, we always play footy. We had footy boots. We had mouth guards. We had everything you need to have. And that's only because mum and dad, as you say, sacrificed everything to do that. And I'm sure there's lots of immigrant parents doing exactly the same thing today. What position were you in footy? Um, I played front row and second row. I was a really big, fast, typical Greek, mate. I matured at 15. <laughs> like I was a man. You were the guy we're yeah. looking across going, hang on, he's 15, he's got a beard. It was, like, it was like all those Canterbury guys. I mean, I don't know if you played SG ball against Canterbury guys. Huge. Remember the 15 under... Well, Beards. When SG ball in those days was under 15, 16 inches. Yeah, they were. Yeah. The guys had fucking beards and hairy. shit. Hairy. They get yeah. so hairy early. Yeah, they were shaven. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, and, uh, and like most of the Aussie kids, their balls hadn't even dropped, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and they're, st- they're looking at what the fuck. Um, it, yeah, but uh, so I was one of those big. I was 81 kilos or something when I was 15. So I played oh. front row. Um, I, I played in the same, I was in the same year at school as Graham Hughes, heaps. So heaps and I played. Most of our footy together, but he's a year above me when it came to footy. So he played mm-hmm. when I was playing SG ball. He played the one above. It was in those days it was Jersey Flag, I think, or maybe that was a couple of years above. But he's a couple of years above me. So I, that was the year I played in. So there was a lot of good footballers around. When heaps as successful as a cricketer, oh, wasn't he? Cr- played, played for New South Wales and cricket. Not, not many boys played both mm. New South Wales rugby league and cricket. He was one of the few. Mm. I don't know anyone else who's done that. You being an encyclopedia of a sport might know somebody. There's not. A, I mean, you, you had chalk as far as boxing is concerned. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, I know a few cricketers have played. I think uh, representative rugby league as juniors, but certainly you got bo- goes uh, a lot in America. You know, Bo Jackson was the first one. A oh, baseballer. Yeah, he was baseball and played NFL. <clears throat> so he played. He was playing for Kansas City in uh, baseball, and then he was playing for the LA Raiders. Uh, in football, have you inherited any of this uh, memory recall, this recall stuff? Yeah, us. Yeah, I've got a fair bit of it. What about Jack over there in the court? Jack, who? D- d- what did you get? Trisha's jeans. Uh, You're the best looking out of all, by the way. Comedy wise, Trisha's jeans. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, you got both. <laughs> Double threat. Uh, Double threat. Well, um, Mark, uh, the genesis of Wizard Home Loans, the idea, you know, jumping in and doing it. What? What was the genesis? That's, well, um, what happened was I was doing property development with a good friend of mine, and um, we'd done a lot of property development. We bought this property in Barrel, in Burradu, and it was an old school site. It was an empty school site, and we had to turn it into a development. We paid the deposit. We had, I don't know, I can't remember, three months to settle. And um, when it came to the settlement, um, <laughs> about three weeks before, we couldn't get the funding because normally you, in those days you went and got funding from the rural bank. There's a bank in Sydney called the, New South Wales called the Rural Bank of New South Wales, and it funded people in the bush, and we're in the bush, relatively speaking. I'm going back a long time, 50-odd years, for 45 years. And Nick Whitlam was appointed the chairman of the rural bank, and rural bank changed his name to the State Bank of New South Wales. And they decided they want to become like a proper bank, like a bank for everybody, not just for country people. So we couldn't get any funding. And I thought, oh my God, we're going to lose our deposit here. We're stuffed. And my business partner, Billy Shipton, he said to me, one of the girls in the office who knows a, a boyfriend's a, a mortgage broker. I don't even know what a mortgage broker was. I said, okay. So she, he went and got the money. He got us, he got us set, set up in um, like three weeks. The deal settled, beautiful. But I did know a fair bit about what you call capital markets, because I have a master's degree in capital markets. Back in those days, I did it. And um, so I thought, Aussie's doing a good job here, because I, I was mates with John, John Simons. And uh, I thought, I wonder if I could do the same thing as he's doing. And uh, so I said to these blokes who just helped us out on our property development, like, you ever thought about doing what John Simons is doing? They said, oh, we can't do that. I said, yeah, you can. And uh, so I went and bought, I bought, start, I bought 40% of the business, then I bought another thirty percent, sold my house, bought another thirty percent, and then eventually I bought a hundred percent, and uh, and I, I, these guys stayed with me, and then I gave them some sort of what they call synthetic equity sit behind me. So I gave them some synthet- synthetic equity, um, and I and I ran the business with two of the original four guys, just two, uh, three of the original four guys. That they, they did the business with me, and it wasn't called Wizard. It was called um, I can't remember the name it was called, but it was. Um, it was a boring fucking name, so I just mm. changed it to Wizard because I just. Why? Learned. What was Wizard for? Yeah, everyone asks me. I, I, look, Google. You know, I went through the fucking dictionary. This sounds really basic, right? <laughs> I went through a dictionary and I picked out some names that I thought had Southern Cross Home Loans, all these different names, Australian sort of names, and um, and I had the opportunity. I had that. I sat next to Richard Branson on a plane, 
and uh, you know you got to make every opportunity jump. And I sat next to him and I asked him why he called his thing virgin. He said, "Strong sounding letters doesn't matter if people like the name or not, as long as they remember the name. Um, be controversial if you want to be." So I picked. I, th I out of the names, I had the name Wizard in there because I like sportsmen who are wizards. Like you know, like remember Wizard from uh, who played for us halfback, the, the New Zealand. Gary Freeman. Yeah, the Wiz. And, yes. they, and like there were a number of players and I thought, oh, Wizard Home Loans and Wizard with Finance. I thought that's one of my names I had in the list of 10. And then I thought about what he said, what Branson said, A-R-D. That's a hard sounding, strong sounding word, wizard, virgin. People fucking remember it. I did a bit of a thing around. People said, that's a stupid name. I thought, well, it doesn't really matter if it's stupid as long as you remember it. There's no point we call it Great Southern Home Loans because mm. people are going to all... That sounds mm. okay, but it's a bit sanitised, you know. Mm. Like, uh, so that's why Wizard. It's a name I got inspired by what he said about Virgin, and I just thought it sounded like the right name. Well, look, Mark, to go in and do that, um, you start to upset the establishment. Very successful. The big banks to you. Did you, did you cop any of that? In the beginning, um, no, because I, I sort of directed my traffic at John Simons. So John was a big name. We're, both, we're good mates, so it was done in best best of humour. But at the same time, we were at each other a few times too. Um, so what I did is because I, I, he would just have an ad on the in the back of the pa Sunday t Telegraph. I worked out you can't take the banks on pretty quickly. And I thought I'll let him do it. Let him bash them. And equally, I thought, well, but I've got to pick a, pick a target. You know, like you're playing footy, you've got to pick a target. You want to make a name for yourself, pick a target. And let everybody know you picked a target. So Johnny's put an ad on the back of the paper. Uh, if you want to beat the banks, go to Aussie Home Loans. So I put a big front full page ad on the back of the Sunday Telegraph. If you want to beat the banks, go to Aussie Home Loans. If you want to beat Aussie Home Loans, go to Wizard Home Loans. <laughs> <laughs> well, a similar thing you know, tells that story. When the Packers owned the Women's Weekly, he brought out Women's Day. And he wrote, Women's Day, not, not your average weekly W E A. K L Y, and fair to say, Kerry Packer didn't really like that. How, did, how did John respond? Um, jo John didn't like it, but and 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 what he did is he actually wrote he he got quoted in an article in those days, I think it was a CBD column. It's still around these days, but he got quoted in an article as saying saying that um, the wizard business is a disaster waiting to happen, and uh, I remember the words and. Um, I was sort of pretty keen to make sure that that wasn't going to be the case because, you know, we were spending, like, a lot of money. And I, I, I sold my house and then I borrowed a little bit of dough as well. I had another property that I borrowed against and I, I was pumping everything into it. So the last thing I could afford, I had four kids, four little kids. So the last thing I could afford is a, um, a lose all my money and a divorce as well. Like, that would have been a drama for me. Um, I ended up getting divorced, but it doesn't matter. But it was after I made the money, so it was okay. It's oh, perfect. Just, just very expensive, that's all. But, <laughs> but, 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 but I couldn't afford that, that to happen to be a drama. And uh, so I, 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 I went after John. I just went after Aussie. And I let him beat the banks up. Because, you know, when I became partners with Kerry, Kerry said to me one day, I know he's not here, so I can tell the story. Kerry right? Packer? Yeah, Kerry Packer. Yep. So... One day, you know, Ginge, Dave Gingell, Ginge and I are great mates, okay? And, Ginge, and Kerry in his building had a gym, a well-known gym. And, but he had his own personal private gym too down the bottom, which no one's allowed to go to, just him and his mates. But Kerry was away. And David knew, and Dave was only his 30s then, Ginge knew the code to get into Kerry's private gym. And in the gym, there's a big sauna and this massive spa pool, right? Massive spa pool. And there's like a big change room, private room for Kerry at the back where you can relax and have a cigarette. And then there's the gym itself. Gin says, Kerry's away. Let's go down to the gym. I said, yeah, sweet. Let's do it. And uh, we'd just gone into business together. And uh, go down to the gym and we're in the nude in the in the sauna, you know, fucking walking around, <laughs> fucking, you know. And anyone who knows knows David by reputation, um, him being nude is very intimidating to everybody else. <laughs> and we got we got in the spa where the spa's huge, massive big spa, not a not a close one, big one, like a bloody swimming pool. And I'm in the spa and you wouldn't believe it, Kerry walks out of the private room. <laughs> nude. <laughs> Was he intimidating? <laughs> he said, no. He said, <laughs> six foot four. That's intimidating. Yeah. Kerry Packers intimidating. He said, what the fuck are you two doing in here? 
And we went, oh, fuck, we'll go, we'll go, we'll get out. No, he said, no, you won't, you'll fucking stay here. And he made us stay in the spa. He jumped in the spa and he's just punishing the shit out of us, right? And like this stage, my fingers are shriveling up, you know, the old fella's shriveling, everyone's shriveling up. Like I'm fucking thinking, I've got to get the fuck out of here. And he says to me, he goes, uh, son, how's business going? I said, oh, it's pretty good. And he, st- he started saying, D- I don't want you out there knocking the banks. He said, like, like the other bloke's doing. I said, no, I don't worry. I'm not going to start that war. And, he's, uh, and he said, you know why? I said, no, yeah, he's going to tell me. He said, where does an 800-pound gorilla shit? I said, I don't know. He said, wherever he fucking wants. And he said, that's what the bank's going to do. They're going to shit on you. So don't take them on. And that's and that was the best bit of advice ever. I because a few times there I I was tempted. They you know they opened themselves up to be easily taken on. I could have easily jumped on the bandwagon with John, but his advice, his counsel was don't take them on because they'll hurt you eventually. We're sort of pushing through this pretty quickly, you know. But but the decision, you know, a great success was at home loans. The decision to sell. Mark, firstly, how tough was that given the fact you hand up, you know, you're basically handing over the baby? Well, that part of it became tough down the track um, because I didn't realise how important it was to me in terms of my life. Um, the people, the organisation I sold to business to were very good. They wanted me to stay as chairman, but I didn't really have anything to do. I just they wanted to keep, they just wanted to keep me there. Um, so the decision to sell financially... Well, I'll backtrack. It wasn't my decision because one day I went in to see Kerry and in those days he was there with his CEO, um, a guy called Ashok Jacob, a real good operator. And Kerry said to me, and I used to see him once a month, and he said to me, son, how much money do we owe? Because he always wanted how much money we owed, how much money is owed to us, how much money we've got in the bank, but you know, the usual sort of questions every time. So he went through very all his usual questions and he said, usual one, how much money do we owe? And I said, we owe $19 billion. He hadn't asked me for a couple months and he went white. You know, I'm literally like, it's like just went pale. He said, what the fuck, 19? I said, yeah, but we got $19 billion worth of assets. He said, so what? I said, yeah, but it's not so what, mate. Is it because the assets are tied to the mortgage? So like every time we lend, we borrow. That's how it works. He said, well, who we borrowed from? I started telling him. He said, well, and most of the money comes out of US and, US and Europe and the UK, most of it. And he said, well, what, are, what currency are we borrowing? And we'd have to, I said, well, we're borrowing, borrowing UK pounds, sterling, euros, and US dollars. He said, what happens if the dollar moves against us? I said, I've, got hedge, I've hedged every contract. They call it book matching. So I hedged every contract for currency risk. I hedged every contract for interest rate risk. And I hedged every contract for prepayment speed. So I said, we're completely hedged. And I said, we pay a fee for that. We still make good money. He said, who do we hedge with? I said, we hedge with global banks, mate. Like banks, and I, I won't say the names, but banks that like anyone would know who they are. And he said, how do you know they're not going to go broke? I said, come on, mate. They're not going to go broke. One of them was the sixth largest bank in the world at times. The banks are not going to go broke. He said, son, there's no good for me. There's no, this is too much for me. He said, uh, this is too big for us. We're going to sell. That's how it started. That's how the sale process started. And this was in 2004, but two of those banks went broke mm. in 2008. So your, in the time, GFC. so your timing was perfect. Well, we perfect in two respects, but not, not, not purposefully. Mm. Well, from, from his point of view, purposely, Maddie, but uh, I wasn't from my point of view purposefully, purposefully, but two things that were well-timed was one, we missed the GFC, which is great, but two... The Australian property market, we sold in 2004, started dying off in 2005. So we were going through a massive property boom here in between 1999 and 2004, a bit like we've just gone through here in Australia. And then the property boom started to drop off. So the amount of transactions we were doing were less post-sale. No one would have pred- I, you know, none, no one could predict that. But Kerry's, that's him. Like he's a gambler. Like he's got a great sense of timing. A lot of these guys have got this brilliant sense of timing. You know? They can always time themselves into good deals. And that's what he did. Talking about Kerry's gambling, did you see the John Daly TikTok thing recently? No, what was it? He was talking about how Kerry, <clears throat> they're, in a, they're in a casino. Uh, John Daly was in there and he said, this big Australian guy walks in, Kerry Packer. Anyway, he starts gambling and he, he loses. And he says to the casino, he loses something like $9 million, And he says to the casino, well, 
I'll fix you up tomorrow. They said, no, 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 you fix this up now. So Kerry has to scout around and get the money, and he's just grabbed an extra couple of million. You know, I thought, I'll take him on, have one more crack. John Daly says something like he turned it into 50 million and said, right, uh, and the casino said, yep, come back tomorrow, we'll have the money. He said, no, no, <laughs> fuck yous, get it for me now. Yeah, well, mate, that's and that's his game. Like, talk about, like, he was the ballsiest bloke, like, ever. Like, and he was, and it, like, in Vegas, Las Vegas, he, he is like a legend when it comes to gambling. So much so that he was banned from a few of the casinos. So it was only, St- it was, I think it was only Steve Wynn in the end, it was Steve Wynn casinos that he was allowed to go into. All the rest of it, because he bust them. You know, he'd win like so much money. Um, yeah, he it was just, and he took me one time to Steve Wynn's um, golf course because uh, I became good friends and I was over there. And he was staying in the Bellagio, which is one of the Wynn's um, places. And he took me over to, um, he said, let's go to the, let's go to the uh, Steve Wynn's private golf course in the middle of the desert. And went in his car, and mate, it was unbelievable. This, this, gr- it was like a green oasis in the middle of the desert. Big fence around it, eight and hole golf course. Win had a house there, his, his home there, and there was a, like a private, um, place with a club, golf club, like where you go with clubhouse. Mm. And there was Bill Gates had a locker, Kerry Pack had a locker. Um, they like, got those sorts of dudes. Like there's like ten different lockers in there, and they were, Kerry was one of the lockers, and. Uh, it was like it, it was like I don't even know whether how, how we how, how we got that wouldn't have had to get had to get back either. Of course, he made me hit a few balls and I uh, made a fucking right goose of myself. And he, t- <laughs> he got got the club and he threw it. And he said, "Fucking, it's, you don't embarrass me anymore." He got the fucking club out of my hands. He just fucking threw it. <laughs> <laughs> he said, "Don't embarrass me." He said, "Well, uh, there was no one there. Like it was just a few pros and shit like that, not pros but professionals." Yep. And. Uh, yeah, so uh, but it, because like I haven't played golf for ages, and like somebody pulls up and says I'll hit a few golf balls. What the fuck? Like uh, you know, you're in the middle of it. So I was a nervous wreck. Like I was fucking sweating. He's sitting there watching me, and I I duffed every one of them. <laughs> Your experience uh, with New South Wales, the Blues. Yeah, um, I don't know too much about it, but I I remember the old Blues jersey with Wizard on the front. What was it like working with the Blues? Ah, oh, it's mate. Cooper, this, I have, it sounds tragic, but it's one of the best periods of my life over a 10-year period. Like, uh, we took over when Tui's pulled out, the Super League period. Um, Tommy was the first coach we ever had. Went through lots of different coaches. So in those days, anyway, I don't know about it now, but they used to invite me down to the sheds, win or lose. Losing was like... like a Worst thing in the world, is it? It's like a death. Because Mark, Mark Cooper wasn't just a sponsor. He was part of the squad. You were part of the team. Did you get the ring? No, I'd retired by then. <laughs> you didn't no. get a ring? No, I didn't. Were you in any of the teams that I was supposed no. to? No. So no. Joey got a ring? Yeah, he probably got a couple. No, but he had, because well, I gave a ring out, like a yeah. diamond ring, like the US style. When they NFL. won? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, Dad, you didn't win. You won it. Yeah, mate, again, people don't, the fans don't like no, that. I'm not, I'm not no, doing no, it no, in a true. negative way. I was just trying to. No, that's right. Yeah, Give okay. a bit of background. Because you wouldn't get a ring, obviously, Thanks. to lose it. No, yeah. no, you don't. you got to be in a so, winning series, and yeah. I gave a ring out to everybody. But it was, it was, answer your question, it was just, I like, to be part of that for me is like, like, it was probably one of my greatest dreams of my life. You know, you know Alex Volkanovsky? You know how, you know, famous he is as a UFC fighter, he undefeated in, the, in his division, blah, 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 the GOAT. In the featherweight division. You know, he said to me about a year or two ago, maybe two or three years ago, he said, one of my greatest dreams is to be in the state of origin camp. New South Wales state of origin camp. Like, here he is, the UFC champ. Like, everyone would have been going, my God, it's Alex Alex Volkanovsky. And that, for me, was the same. And I knew what he was saying. Like, and Freddie brought him in. But, like, for me, it was the same. Like, to be just around those people, those elite sportsmen, Watching the game that when I was a kid in the early 80s, I would go with my dad. I would take my dad and I'd take him. We'd sit at the back of, um, when those days was Sydney Football Stadium. I'd sit, we, the only tickets I could afford were at the back there on the, behind the posts. And I used to sit there. Mum would make us a thermos of soup. And my man and I would sit there. We'd sit there in the rain. That's how tragic we were. Just the two of us. There'd sometimes be no one there. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, that was just amazing for me. Very successful period too. A and lot of success. Bloody oath. The bonding nights, Mark. Like I remember one, they got a lot of the old boys back. We had a big bonding night, right, Coops. And it was 2003 or 2004. Ricky was the coach, Mark. I remember yeah. we were all there. They got Noiseworks to play. Noiseworks played at, at a pub, you know, acoustic. We're having a great night. 
and it's about midnight, one o'clock, and Joey says, righto, we're all going to the city. And Ricky says, no one's going to the city. And Joey said, we're going to the city. And Ricky said, no one's going to the city. And Joey and Ricky start arguing. Next minute, Joey's... Ricky and Joey got each other by the throat. And Joey's going, you're always fucking jealous of me. You're jealous of me, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> but were, there were some great characters in those sites. Oh, New South Wales had some big characters. Not saying they don't have today, but relatively speaking. I mean, there were some big, big names. Uh, Freddie, Joey, for example. Like um, uh, Fitzy. Mm. I mean, that back row. I used to watch that back row run on. Fitzy. Luke Rickardson and Ben Kennedy, and you're going, well, they're not going to lose. That's right. And, and, and people forget about Ben Kennedy. Mm. He was amazing. He was a great ma- competitor. Ma- an amazing competitor. And he played Newcastle, didn't he? But, yeah. Did He left uh, <clears throat> He left uh, Canberra, come to Newcastle, won a comp at Newcastle, and then... Manly. Yeah, then he went to Manly. And it's really underestimated what he did at Manly. Des brought him to Manly when they were sort of coming out of the Northern Eagles mess, and they'd had a couple of really down years. And he brought him into Manly and really changed the culture. Taught all those young guys how to win. And Bukay was a great character. Like Des is very much, you know, fitness first. And when when Bukay went there, he said, looked at the players, and the players just weren't having a good time. And after the games, they're drinking cordial. And he he said to Des, he, I appreciate fitness, but mate, the boys should be able to have a beer after the game. And Des says, okay, got it, no mm. problem. And he he was a big reason. I mean, he he never won a comp with Manly. But I, but he sent him on the right track. Yeah, yep. very much work hard, play hard. Sort of still is now ish, but um, he's older. Yeah, yeah. It's we all uh, get pulled up when we get old. But, well, yeah. Betsy, but, but Danny Bedaris for me is one of the great characters of, of that Origin period. Mm. I mean, he, another unsung hero for me. Like, really made a big difference to the side. There was quite a few Newcastle blokes. It was in that side yeah. uh, when when Danny was there. Uh, I can't remember who played. Um, who's the outside centre now? Um, Mark Hughes. Matt Gidley? Gidley. Yeah, yeah. You know you've had an impact when it, when everyone throws a flick pass, they go, the Gidley flick. Yeah. yeah. Just, on, just on Bedsy, 2003 or 2004, one of, one of those series again. Mini was just a bit the player of the series. But they're playing at Lang, Lang Park, Suncorp Stadium. And I'll never forget this. I think this sums Bedsy up as a competitor. Joey kicks off, and it's a high-floating kick. And literally... Shane Webke, as he catches the ball almost, Bedsy hits him almost as he receives the ball. Like on, when you watch it, he actually winds up for 20 metres before Joey kicks the ball and goes bang and goes down like a bullet and like hits Webke almost as he receives the ball under the sticks. And that set the tone for the game. How and do the you series. remember this shit? Like, I mean, like when you're looking up, then it looks like they were playing it. There's, there's something. I mean, it's like you got some sort of weird videography memory or something. He's on acid. It's a gig. He's go- still he's watching it. Yeah, still. Yeah. yeah. Let's push that on the down. Yeah, so. We do have to edit that out. <laughs> Jack out. No, yeah. leave it in. Uh, before we move on, just with the sponsorship, was it always going to be league, or did you ever have, like? Was there any other sport? Was and was that a personal decision or was it a business decision for Wizard when you sponsored State of Origin? So I, I sponsored uh, the Australian te- uh, the uh, New South Wales Open in those days, which was at White City, which Ginge got me to do. I sponsored um, the Australian Rugby League um, a couple of Anzac tests, which again Ginge got me to do when he, when he was at IMG. Um, I sponsored um, the Beasties East Rugby Union side uh, for a number of years. Um, that was just a f- fun thing and. Uh, yeah, that, 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 that was a lot because some of my sons played for, for, for the junior rep sides, so I just did it out of fun. Um, but New South Wales came up as a result of um, um, Tui's pulling out, and they pulled out during the Super League period. And a mate of mine was working in New South Wales Rugby League, and he just said, mate, there's a great opportunity. You just should go and get it. You nick it because they didn't have a sponsor. It was like literally a week before. They, they played the first game. So I, the jerseys in the shops didn't have Wizard on originally. That We just got on the first jerseys for the first game, just literally for the players. That's it. And uh, yeah, so, so I so I nicked it. I, I, it was, for me, Cooper was more opportunistic. I didn't sit down and think, oh, fuck, you know, we're going to get this many people watch it. I just knew State of Origin. It's, I'd love to do it. But it was more, it was, let's call it cheap, relatively speaking. Yeah. But I, but. It was took a lot of money away from me. It was a very, relatively speaking, also very expensive for me, like cheap but also expensive for a small business. But it launched our business, bar nothing. I mean, it was one of the great. I mean, 
help me then get on the footy show. And in those days, you know, we had the footy show and get the sponsor on. And Fatty rings, you know, they, they'd ring me up, the producer. Um, Glenn Pallister. Glenn would ring me up and say, mate, uh, you know, we got uh, someone's, you know, we're running a competition and, um, you know, Fatty's going to talk about you. And uh, uh, I, who else is on there? Uh, 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 Blocker was on in those days. Now they'll talk about you, you know. Um, you know, can you come in with a case? It looks like you got twenty grand cash in it. You just put just put the bills on the top, <laughs> and uh, open it up. And Fatty goes. So I, I remember they filmed, they sort of pre-filmed that or pre-recorded it. I'm sitting at home watching the footage show, getting excited. It's going to come on in my little segment. And Fatty goes, uh, "That Mark Boris Blake and uh, blocks there." And they goes, "That Mark Boris Blake. Uh, what's the name of his company?" Uh, <laughs> What's that weird name? And uh, watch me call it. That's what he said. <laughs> so I'm straight on the phone again. Just said, "Mate, you fucking joking?" Like I just gave fucking whatever watch it was twenty grand. Watch me call it. So uh, they agreed. So I got a second round. But uh, I was a sponsor in New South Wales, so that sort of helped me get into those environments. Yeah. And then when I was doing the New South Wales Footy Show, um, Eddie, who I became friendly with, got me put me on the uh, Victorian Footy Show. Mm. So it was very good to leverage. And make great audiences, TV audiences, those sorts of audiences are great for us. We lend money to people who need to borrow dough. Mm. Yeah. Perfect for us. Talking about borrowing dough, um, we've got a situation now where Cooper's moved back into the house. He wants to borrow some money. Well, yeah. he's always wants to borrow some money, Mark. <laughs> but it's a fucking nightmare. It really is. We're trying to sort of move him out of the house. But but quite seriously, the price of living. I bought a splice the other day when I was hung over. Four fucking dollars, please. Um, it's not a golden gate time, that's how. Uh, but... For young people, you mentioned it before, there's a lot of people working really hard, people living on the bread line. But for young people, you know, this great Australian dream, buying their first home, um, where's it at, Mark? I, 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 if Cooper, where it's a problem for, say, Cooper and Jack, your kids, is that if they're thinking about buying their great Australian dream like their parents did in the area where their parents grew up or where their parents might have gone for a surf, like in your case, you're on the northern beaches, that's going to be a problem for him. But if Cooper's thinking about, I want to get into the property market, I think he's got to change his mindset. I think he's got to think about buying maybe, you know, northern New South Wales perhaps or somewhere where he can afford just to get into the property market. So I think the view that I take is that young people should stay at home as long as they can. Parents don't Thank like you. it necessarily. Yeah. <laughs> but they should. You should. And save up as much money as you can and get into the property market in place where you can afford to borrow. And borrowing, you know, and buying, you know, I don't know, um, Nora Heads or Coffs Harbour or wherever, north, south, wherever you want to go, or in regional areas at Orange, wherever it is, those areas will grow. I don't mean pick stupid areas, but pick areas that have infrastructure and amenities and schools and airports and hospitals and that sort of stuff, do all the usual homework, and just get into those markets. That's the problem I have is that the Great Australian Dream has to be amended. Our mindset about what is the Great Australian Dream has gone. Kids, our kids, will not be able to afford to buy where they went to school and where where we live now and with, as much as we'd like them to be close. But what we've got to encourage them to do is stay home for as long as possible. My youngest boy, Jimmy, how old are you, Cooper? 24. Okay, my youngest boy, Jimmy, stayed home until he's 31. Mm. Um, you know, it was annoying the shit out of me. Um, <laughs> but he stayed home. Like, And uh, in the end, to be honest, when he left, I, I sort of missed him. Mm. Uh, you know, mm. Jimmy, I missed him a lot. Cooper moved out of the house for a while. We playing at the Melbourne Storm. How long were you gone for? Five years. Yeah, Five right. Years. Anyway, what, what, when he's come home for Christmas, what was once charming, such as his habits, such as he, Mark, I, I kid you not, he would walk around for days, uh, wouldn't shower, and all he would do, he'd wear a uh, the Hugh Hefner... Um, Robe. He had a robe, <laughs> and there'd be nothing underneath it. And we used to laugh about, oh, look at this, he's quirky, it's really good. But when he moved home, he was still doing it every fucking day. What became, it became quite charming and funny, became like just this... Sad. It was yeah. re really, really sad. Did you live like that down in Melbourne? I did, I did. I lived down there with Harry Grant, and he would say the same thing. He'd go out surfing all day and then he'd come home and I'd be sitting there with a bag of chips just sitting like a, <laughs> like a slob in a robe. That's why he's retired, Mark. With my balls hanging out underneath. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's, it's funny, but it's sad uh, in a sense. But now well. you're still doing the same? I still do the same, yeah. I still do the same. But I got my missus is here as well now, Mark, so she kind of holds me a little bit more to account. Yeah, so that's a, it's, it's a, and how's it like having the daughter-in-law? She's she's fantastic. Yeah. 
in the house. Yes, she's she's fantastic. And, and it really equates the house up. Trish and I argue upstairs. They argue downstairs. So it's, it's like I, feel, I, feel, I feel sorry for Jack. But uh, <laughs> but no, she, no it's, it's great having her in the house. And I find out everything about Cooper through her. I'll say, Kenna, is Cooper... It's going to sound pathetic because he's 20, 24 or 25. A good so. lover. I'll say, no, mate. Um, she said no. <laughs> is he cleaning his teeth? Why are you joking? And she'll go, he's not, Matt. I'm chipping him. He's not cleaning his teeth. Kenna, is he showering? No, Matt. I've tried to get him to shower the last two days and he hasn't. I was like, so I'm work- I find out everything that Cooper's at, what's going on in his life through Kenna. Well, it's funny. My, I'm, I'm saying I used to find all about Jimmy through his girlfriend Vanessa. They're now engaged, but I used to find everything, everything about him. Um, that she, she calls him Boris. She doesn't even call him James. Or Boris, <laughs> Boris, there's but and, uh, and but, but, but she would live with us for so long that I forgot she was living with us. And uh, I was seeing my dentist, and my dentist said to me, "Oh, so and so, blah blah blah. She, she had, she's got a bit crook last week or something like that." And uh, I said, "Who's that?" She said, uh, do you know a girl called Vanessa, blah, blah. And I said, no, not really. <laughs> not th- she'd been fucking living in a house on and off for 10 years. Like, and uh, because uh, that's what happens. So because she's so easy going mm. and I liked her so much um, as a kid. She's a good kid. And uh, that, that she become like one of the, the family, like one of the households. So I'm sure this next Mm. What's your, what's your daughter in law's so called or potential daughter in law's name? Kenna. 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 Yeah, don't worry. Be mm. careful. <laughs> but Mark, your <laughs> first home you bought, Mark? Uh, first property I bought was uh, an apartment in Sylvania Waters, or not in Sylvania, just on the poor side of Sylvania Waters. Um, I bought it from Harry Triggerboff. Triggerboff. Um, I paid uh, forty seven thousand dollars for it. Harry uh, Merriton in those days lent me forty thousand, and I borrowed seven thousand dollars from the bank. Mm. That's where I got my forty-seven thousand from. Terrifying, isn't it? When you buy your first home, I remember we bought Trish and I bought in New Lambton, Newcastle. Great area to raise kids. Great, and uh, it was one hundred and forty thousand. I remember as we got the loan from the bank, thinking to myself, "I know I'll never be able to pay this off." Oh, Eventually, that it's going. But you know, like it. And yeah. It does wind up selling it privately, by the way, a few years later, for 167. About three years later, and my me and Trish couldn't believe it. You know, like twenty seven thousand dollar profit. You know, and it, it was it was really good for but us. Big but money. Then, absolutely, my word. Yeah. Like I remember Jeff Fennick told me once that uh, he won twenty grand, and he thought at one stage he's just going to give. It wasn't for world title or something. He just thought at one stage he's going to give boxing away because he's thought I made it. I made I made it in, in my life. I got twenty fucking thousand. This is probably in the eighties. Like uh, uh, relatively speaking, when I, I sold my place to, I have to say I, I want to say this publicly. Harry Triggerboff. A lot of people say lots of things about him. The old guy's ninety odd years, nine years of age. I have to thank him publicly because I would never have been able to borrow the money from the bank, and his company Meriton lent me that forty odd thousand dollars back then, and it actually put me on the property market and got me used to it. And I made. I sold it for seventy five thousand dollars a few years later. Mm. And made some money out of it, and uh, it was a good experience for me. They were very nice to me. I remember the interest rate was seven and a half percent. It was much more expensive than a bank. Yeah, I mean, I and people uh, don't give pay tribute enough to people to help you along the line mm. and along the way. And he's one dude that did help me along the line. And what he wasn't a billionaire in those days; he was just kicking off. So, yeah, I'm I'm pretty happy about that. Talking about people with short memories, rugby league. I said long knives, short memories. Let's talk about one second, like. The Roosters, you're incredibly passionate about. The chairman, Nick Politis, unbelievable. You know, like Doyen. passion. It's, but Nick will come to a point, you know, maybe soon, you know, that he, he'll step down as chairman. Uh, you're the favourite to take over. Am I? <laughs> That's what they tell me. The bookies got you as the red-hot favourite. What, what's your thoughts on that? If Nick asked me to become the chairman of the Roosters, I would um, happily accept. I would, I would be... It'd be one of the greatest things for me to do in, in my life, particularly as I'm getting older now. Um, nothing would be more awesome than for me to be the chairman of the club that I love um, and that I put a lot of time and effort into. Did you grow up a Rooster supporter? No. I grew up a Bulldog. Well, they weren't You're even called doggies. the Bulldogs. They were called the Berries. Berries. Ah. That's how far back I go. <laughs> I swapped sides during the Super League. Okay. In Canterbury, as you know, uh, mm. took the bait. And uh, and I was uh, I, I moved to Bondi when I was seventeen, 
So I've been I've been there for uh, fifty one years, so of my life. So and uh, and I but I, I I got a little bit upset with Canterbury, and uh, taken the the bait. And um, I thought well, I'm living in these suburbs. I'm going to go for the Roosters because they're a foundation club. So that's how I started, and uh, and I've been I've been on the board for twenty years now, twenty one years, something like that. Um, and uh, Nick's one of my great mates, and a lot of other guys there. They're all my great mates. So. Yeah, it'd be nothing better for me, um, Mandy. Like it, I could think, and the only thing is, a bloody big shoes to fill, though. Mm. Oh my God, like, imagine if we didn't, if we come last, we come <sighs> second last, oh. the first year that I was, there, oh, God oh, Almighty, mate. that'd be horrible. And deal, and and, uh, and dealing with the player agents. Oh, well, I, uh, I mean, we used to talk about used car sales, but these blokes <laughs> are a whole nother level. Well, I, but, I, but I, if I, if that happened, I'd say to Nick, I think Nick is never going to give the game, never give it away. If you mm. know what I mean, like, and I'd say that. Maybe that's I, he loves doing that. He knows them. They know him. They love him. He loves to you know get your Sunny Bills and your Cooper Cronks and all those sort of guys into the club and or, and or back to the club. So I think he probably would continue over. I can't ever see Nick just saying, "Oh, that's it. See you later. I'm going to Greece." Like he's not going to do that. What if when he goes to Greece and he gets someone to put the mobile? He used to get people to put the the, the radio next to them, and he'd listen. On the radio from Greece yeah. over his mobile to the yeah. game. Yeah, yeah. It didn't matter what time of day it was. Um, no, no, not relevant. I mean, the guy's like the most obsessed, passionate person about the Roosters that I that I, that you just can't imagine. And what he knows about the the business, like that that our club, it's both the league's club and the footy club too. So it's both. Um, it's amazing, and what he puts into it, like I could never put that into it in terms of time. It just he spends an inordinate for a man of his age. He's incredible. Like he's in his eighties, heading towards mid eighties. Um, he's got the energy of a sixty-year-old. Like it's ridiculous. It doesn't matter how rich he's a super rich guy. It's not about the money he puts in the joint. It's the intellectual property he puts in the joint. It's mental. Has he got a? Uh, all owners of NRL clubs usually have like we usually call them their sons. Like they've got a favourite. Has Nick got a favourite at the Roosters? He's got one son. Oh, how do you mean? Like, has he got a favourite uh, player? In the team? Yes. Oh, uh, there's been a few. Freddie obviously was was one, is one. Um, in the current crop. In the current crop. Uh, uh, he used to love Cooper Cronk, like, seriously love Cooper Cronk. Um, he loved Fitzy. Fitzy, but, you know, Fitzy now is coaching another club, as you know. Uh, in our current crop, I don't think anyone in particular... I don't think there's anyone Ooh. in particular. Not good at no, but when they win, But when they win a comp, like he gives them the incentive, oh, does yeah. he? If you win the comp, we want to take you all to Vegas and yeah, LA totally. and pay for it all. But bear in mind, oh, yeah. but it could be like you're asking a question, what he used to be like. So in the early days um, when, you know, Rick Owen and all them were around, um, they were a bit of a glory day for us. We used to go every year to his ranch in LA, all of us. Me, Freddie, Ricco, Ginch, <laughs> like, you know, Jack L was good, blah, blah, blah. Just the list went on. Um, and, uh, you know, he was younger. Now he's much older. So it's in the, there's a massive gap between him and the players' age group today. Then it was a bit closer. Um, and also, different coach. A lot of that gets left to the coach today. And Robbo is, like, he's a, like a, a, a nation to himself. And I mean that in the nice possible way. Like, he controls everything mm. when it comes to players. He's the best for us. Yeah. He's amazing. Like, uh, you don't need to step in. I'm not saying we need to step in when Sticky was there or others or Gus was there. We've been through all those guys. Uh, we've been, there's been a myriad of ex-coaches. Um, but Robbo, he's got it all under control. Very thoughtful, deliberate man, that word we use again. Everything yeah. he does. Very deliberate. Very thoughtful, smart, well-researched, thinks stuff through way, way ahead of it happening. Um, Long-term planner, Um and he, he touches on every aspect. He's not just interested in just footy. He's interested in developing these guys into men mm. or great people, which is really important to us as a club. I mean, one of the big issues right now for us, I mean, again, is concussion. You know, like uh, we're really keen on, you know, pushing around this whole concussion aspect and how do you treat it and how do you rehabilitate people from it? How do you diagnose it accurately? How do you not put people at risk? Um, but at the same time... Uh, don't create an existential risk to the game. Like, don't try to kill the game. And uh, it's a really big topic, and it's a big topic that but Rob has all over it. Like, he's doing the thinking and then delivering that thinking back to the board for the board to, to, to deliberate on. So that's 
that's incredibly rich stuff. And uh, and Nick's developed all that. I mean, Robbo came because of Nick. Nick got him here, got him out of France. Bear in mind, he was our defence coach in 2010 um, under Smithy. Um, but still, you know, he had some experience with us, with him. But that's great. To me, that's great leadership and great insight. And Nick's a great leader. Mm. I, 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 it sounds really simple, but it's a really complex thing to do. He's a great leader in a really difficult environment. Rugby league is a difficult environment. Lots of stakeholders, <laughs> parents, kids, players, fans, media. It just goes on and on and on. Mm. Just the interest of people. And uh, a great leader is able to manage all that. And I, don't, I won't say manipulate because he doesn't manipulate. He just manages it all. Mm. And he does it brilliantly, I think. Mark, this something going to do with all our guests. A series of questions at the end to give some further insight into you. The first question, the most famous person you've met, and did you like them? Probably the most famous person in terms of numbers of people knowing this particular in individual, definitely Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. um, not initially. No, oh, okay. Didn't like him initially. Mm. It's growing on you? I respect him. I mean, how often is a bloke on doing a television show become a president of the most powerful nation in the world? And he pretty much did it on his own. And favoured to get back in again. Correct. Red hot favourite. Uh, unbelievable. Like just, and like against the odds too. Like, I mean, I'm seriously right now, he's got like, I don't know, 12 charges against him. And the guy is like Teflon, nothing sticks and he doesn't give a shit. Best holiday you've been on? By far Greece. Um, and going to my dad's village in Greece is always a... Uh, a great perspective for me and uh yeah definitely going back to greece back to my dad's village go, go, just quickly sorry coops going back like so mark when you go back there when you like, given the draw do you feel like you're home how, how does it feel like just mixing in the community yeah I, I definitely i've yes i do i do feel a sense of what they call Hel hellenism um i don't feel greek i feel like in a part of a hellenic her heritage and um you know because i like the way of life i like the food I like the way they don't give a fuck. Um, you know, they're just chilled out. They just, you know, it says go 60 kilometers, they do an 80, doesn't really matter. Pay don't taxes. Pay taxes, why bother? Neg negotiate. <laughs> negotiate your taxes. And you're paying stamp duty to buy a property, negotiate your stamp duty. Everything's doable. And I don't mean it's corrupt. I, I'm not talking about it. I'm, it's just doable. Let's fucking get this done. We'll get it done one way or the other. You know, here in Australia, greatest place in the world to live. But to be honest with you, it's like, well, it's very rigid. A lot of rigidity, a lot of regulatory stuff, a lot of rules. I love going there because it's the flip side of that. No problem. Mm. Whatever. Is there a place you'd never go again? Worst? <laughs> Sorry, Bali. Oh, really? Bad. Mm. Why? Just, just don't like it. Um, I couldn't swim in the beaches because it looked a bit dirty to me. Um, I just thought everyone's on the piss too much. It's, just, it's like it's just a mad drinkathon. Um, not that I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> don't get me wrong, but I've had my day at that, you know. Mm. I've done, I've done all that. I don't want to do any more. We a uh, bit of a connection. We took Jack there when he was just a, a baby. It's the last time I've been. Trisha's been another couple of times. I, I, I'm like you. I, I didn't like it. You know, I, if I want to see drunk Aussies, I just go down to my local, yeah, totally. which I do every Saturday. But Cooper was uh, conceived in Bali. Yeah, yeah. Well, you got in love with that. Yeah. Oh, I lo I've been there. We went there for a team trip. With uh, the storm in 2019, uh, which was good fun. About 20 of us went over. Uh, Nelson ended up, Nelson, I said, oh, that one, I remember that. He ended up bashing a, a bloke in the yeah. middle of the street. Um, it was a good trip. Allegedly. Apart from that, all yeah. allegedly, obviously. Uh, I mean, it was, it was provoked, but um, I mean, that was a great trip. I haven't been back since COVID, so I don't know how it is now, but I'd love to get back over. I've got some mates that just love it, like, just wrap it so hard. They just, it's inexpensive, it's got beaches, it's got everything going, you can get reasonable price drinks and stuff like that, and you go with your mates. Just not my go. What you about go? your favourite movie line? Oh. If that's too hard, even just your favourite movie. That's a good one, my favourite movie. That sort of moves around a little bit. Probably my favourite TV series was Breaking Bad. Very I, good. I, I mean, it's I just love that as a series. Um, I just I, I love Mr. White or, or um, I can't remember the name of the guy's actual name in the real world, but uh, you know who was the the leader of the the business, the the, the cocaine business, Walter oh, no, White, Walter White, Mr. White, and uh, and then the references to um, you know famous scientists in it. It was actually incredibly well conceived and and well executed. Like it got me in. I, I just couldn't stop watching it. 
and I'd, I would watch it again. So Breaking Bad was fantastic for me. I wonder how many people that show got into cooking meth. Because well, I watch it. It's like when I watch cooking shows and I go, I could make, like, I'd love to make that as a dish for everyone. But so, I watch that and it makes me think the same thing. Like, that so, looks easy. Hold, I hold, that. hold on. Sorry, Mike. So when, so when you watch Breaking Bad, you actually get the want to go and cook meth? Not make, <laughs> That's taken that out of context. I don't want to go and cook meth, but it makes me watch it. And if I had the aspiration to make that, like, I look at it and I'm like, it basically gives you the tools to make it. Because it goes, it shows you the process of how they make it. It says all of this stuff. So I could, if I if I wanted to, and I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that would want to. But as a Newcastle, challenge, would it make money or to make like to make well, if you want to buy family, your, if you want to buy your first home, I mean that's a quick way. <laughs> we'll, exactly. we'll lend you a sink. You end up getting a cell. <laughs> Wizard <laughs> so home home. You'll get. You'll end up in a cell somewhere. Anyway, actually, but it was a fantastic show, wasn't it? Like, and the oh, characters yeah. are good. Mm. What was the guy's name who was uh, the young guy all the time hanging around him? What was his yeah, name? Yeah, uh, the actor's Jesse. Jesse. Pink. Jesse Pinkman. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, Jesse, he was good. Like yeah. a bloody good actor. You guys mate. ever seen the Neutral Bay, Walter White? He's famous around that part. Sorry. When I get a bu- when I get the bus into the city a bit, he oftentimes jumps up. He's famous around Neutral Bay. There's a guy called the Neutral Bay Walter White. He is like Walter White. He He's like the like twin. Him. Or a doppelganger. Yeah. And people sometimes will approach him and go, excuse me, are you... You know, no, it, it's yeah. He's famous. Does he wear the hat? No, he's got the ball. Got mate. It is honestly. It's it's a twin. So look out for him. Yeah, well, the Walter White. When Walter you catch White the bus, neutral next bay. time I'm up in neutral bay. When you're catching time, the bus. Yeah, next time you're cooking <laughs> meth. Just. Yeah. Uh, what about your favourite song line? Oh, you know, this is this is the sort of these are the sort of questions you ask your old man because he he yeah. probably knows every line of every fucking well, song. If you don't have the if you don't have the line, give us the the song. A favourite song. So we go from meth into lions. Yeah. Well, <laughs> the, the, um, I, I mean, I love anything the Beatles. I mean, I don't want to start showing my uh, age now, but I love any anything from the Beatles. I I can go far back and say I I I loved Elvis, right? Elvis mm. Presley, like Blue Suede Shoes, is one of my most favourite uh, one of my most favourite songs. Roy Orbison, Penny Arcade. I used to love the Penny Arcade, and I, I can play it on the piano. I used to be able to play on the play, piano. Scott Joplin. Um, you know, from um, uh, the movie, I can't think of the name. Movie, I used to play all the Scott Joplin songs. I used to play, I, I, my mother made me do classical music, and I used to find it was boring as shit. So, in that period, I'm going back in the 60s, um, whatever was the latest, most popular thing, Neil Diamond, I, I used to go and get the music. And I'd learn how to play the songs that were the most popular songs at the time. Mm. I'm not a person who listens to lyrics. I listen to tunes. To the music. Mm. I have music going, classical music going in my house 24 hours a day. Mm. When I go to sleep at night, it's always in the background. It's in the lounge room and I can get up. And if I get up to take a piss, which these days is every night, um, and I sometimes twice, I like to be able to hear classical music in the background. Um, I'm, but I'm not, I don't really pay much attention to lyrics. Lyrics aren't something that's important to me. You're like Elton John. Elton John was the same, learned was classic, and then he uh, went out on his own. But he wrote, he doesn't but he wrote listen, songs. He didn't, he didn't write lyrics. Eric, Elvis Costello, same, yeah. Well, I'm interested, yeah. In, I'm interested in the sound. Mm. Yeah. And, I, and jazz, jazz and blues are my favourite. You know, like Muddy Waters and that sort of type of blues, but it and and anything with a, um, a harmonica, I love because it makes me relax. So if I get stressed out, straight on a jazz ABC jazz, or, or I pick some jazz that I might have in, in my phone. Music to me is um, my way of escaping whatever it is that's stressing me out at the time. No, I don't want music, mate. Right, it's your birthday. Right, and you get you got four or five mates come over. You got the garage ready. You can have any artist of all time, and they come and play four songs. Who's the artist? Uh, what are the four songs? I don't know the names of them, but be Muddy Waters. I would like them to come and play me j- just just Muddy Waters. I want them to come and play me all their sets, like awesome blues music with harmonicas just going really hard. Billy Joel too with harmonica, like like he'd be on the piano, be playing the harmonica and singing, and like sing straight after that. But some anyone who can play a harmonica and play a, a play the piano at the same time. So anything piano based and a and a and a harp like a harmonica. This sounds absurd. 
And people will go, the younger people will go, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. But Cooper will go, have no idea. But I'll tell you who was an ama- one of the best accordion players Australia's ever produced, Norman Gunston. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes he'd play the piano accordion yep. and he'd have the... Uh, and he'd have the jokes as well. He'd stop. He'd have. But he had a. Remember, if he had a wire thing, used a wire yeah, frame yeah. that held it up, so we didn't have to touch anything. And uh, and then he would. He'd stop, and then he'd tell a joke. He was amazing. Yeah, like uh, harmonica is quite hard to play. I, I tried to. I tried to learn it, and uh, it's much harder to play than like. It's, I don't mean so much in terms of hitting notes or knowing the notes to hit, but it's actually hitting the notes with your mouth in a certain way. Sucking and blowing. It's a breath thing, isn't it? It's yeah. it's tough. It's it's actually quite hard. I did it for about six months, and uh, I, I I I have a harm, harmonica in my car. So every now and then I just get out and I play scales and stuff. God like forbid that. if when I ever pull up at you with a traffic light, hey, yeah. look up. Is that Mark Burris? <laughs> <laughs> it's orange. <laughs> Made in the paper, it'll be spotted. Mark Burris stuck in traffic, play, <laughs> play <his> muddy <laughs> waters. <laughs> well, especially if you get something on the radio and you all of a sudden you start to hear, there's a bit of harmonica and then you think, fuck, I can do that. And you pull it out and start playing along with it. I do that. Like It's, it's fun. Because, uh, yeah, music's really important. My mother, as I said earlier, comes from a musical family, but... My mother had music going 24 hours a day. I used to know when my mum was in the house because in those days she had a radio and I used to go under the house because I'm six years older than my brother. So I was like the only kid in the house for a long time and I used to go under the house. In those days, everyone got under the house. I don't know about you guys, but under our house was quite large. And Underneath, I could nearly stand up as a little kid and I would follow my mum around the house because I knew wherever the music was, that was the room she was in. So I would get my toys and sit under that room where mum was, listen to the radio, listen to music. And mum played rap music all the time, 24 hours a day, which is what I do. Uh, what about if you're a sports, if you could be any sports star of all time, who would you be? Um, a boxer. I, you know, I mean, I, boxing's my passion. I love boxing. I love the UFC, but I but it's a bit more of a Johnny-come-lately thing. So uh, I love boxing. Um, Marvin Hagler is my mm. most favourite fighter of all time. I'm a left-hander. He's, we're not, that's the only thing we have in common, left-handers. But, um, but he, I used to love watching him, um, his level of fitness, his toughness. Yeah, he, he was amazing. I, uh, so if you said to me, which sports would you have loved to be? You know, I'd love to be in someone like Marvin Hagler in the middleweight division. By the way, during that period, mm. that division was unbelievably strong. It's like... Incredible, like uh, yeah, Sugar Ray Leonard. You had lots of great fighters mm. there, you know. Tommy Hearns. Tommy Durant. Hearns. There's a great, on Fox Sports, The, the Kings, yeah. four-part series. And George Kimbrell had a book out called, it was called, it was based off the book, The Four Kings. It, it Absolutely amazing in the series to watch the different dynamic. That was the 80s. It was unbelievable. That, oh. that division, like, you know, like uh, heavy, uh, uh, light middleweight, middleweight and uh, mid, um, uh, the, the, the super middleweights. They all of them were in that sort of area. They were just every one of them was like could have been the best of all time. Any one of mm. them, and they and they keep talking about this best fight and that best fight, like Hagler, um, Rent Leonard, Hagler, Hearns. You know who knows? They're all the best fights. So, and I, I just thought that was a wonderful period, and and also they were looked up for But they was like they're like movie stars. Yeah. Well, Hagler became a movie star when when he perceived that he was robbed by Sugar Ray Leonard. And that it, was a robbery. I have yeah. to tell you, but Jeff and I talk about it all the time. Sorry, Matty, to yeah. interrupt, but I'm, I'm pretty passionate about this. That was a robbery. Leonard was pretty and hit him more often, but Hagler's punches stuck and really did hurt Leonard. As, and, and you know, I, I'm not just saying that, but mm. I someone like Jeff Fennec, who's an expert, Jeff says the same thing. He reckons Hagler won that fight. Well, he quit. Went, uh, Cooper, after that fight, he said, I was robbed and I will never fight again. And he never did. And he moved to Italy and became a movie star. And he was Hagler? pretty good. He, d- he mm. didn't have much uh, pr- problems like speaking or, or or cognitive issues, et cetera. I don't know what he died of. They never showed, sh- sh- told us yeah. what he died from. It was a bit of a mystery. It wasn't that long ago. But he was in pretty good shape. He looked not messed up. He was good. For a guy, he copped a lot too. He copped mm. a lot of punches. So, th- yeah, Marvin Hagler. What about your least favourite accent and your favourite accent in the world? Oh, my God, Dan. I'll get in trouble here. <laughs> um, I love Irish accent. I, yeah. When if you're talking about in English, speaking yeah, in English, English. Uh, I love the Irish accent. Um, it's it has this is particularly anyone from down the bottom of Ireland from Cork they sort of sing, so it's it's just beautiful to me. Um, and bear in mind, my mother's family is Irish, so that's Irish. Good background. people too. I'd, best place. It's just a great place to go to. Oh, I don't know about now. I might have changed a bit, but I haven't been there for ten years. But just a great place to go to. My least favorite accent. 
South African. It's funny. <laughs> Everyone says it, man. <laughs> Diplomatic immunity. I know. <laughs> just, it's just sound. Look, nothing gets our South African. No, African. no, I got this a lot is... of mates who South African, but I just don't like the accent. I, I just think it's a bit heavy going. It is heavy going. Mm. Uh, right, we've got two more. You can either, this is a would you rather. Would you rather be dumped in the desert or the ocean? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I think of the ocean. Good swimmer? I can swim. I can float. Desert. I mean, I, uh, you're fucked. I mean, like, I don't like the idea of that. So, yeah, yeah put me in the ocean. Yeah. Although, I don't know. Sharks, you know. I don't, although camels, they reckon camels are really no. aggressive. Really? It, it, camels, there's packs of wild camels that op- go out through the desert. <laughs> and you got to be careful. They will kill you. They're very aggressive. But the sun's pretty fucking aggressive, too. Yeah, stuck in the yeah it's true. Yeah. My yeah. God. Right on. Like last, sunburn. last one. Mark Burris, you've, you know, you've, let's say you're brown bread. Okay, you've you've passed away. The coffin we're lifting. Me and Dad, because we're obviously we're the yeah, we're Paul, lifting Paul your coffin. We'll volunteer we're ourselves Thank you. Yeah. for a price. We're uh, Dad's Red Dragon. We we're, we're taking you through. I love Red Dragon. What's the one song that you want played at your funeral? Uh, Ave Maria. It's Beautiful. my mum's favourite song. My, Is it? my late mother's favourite song. Yeah, that's bloody beautiful. Mark loved it today. To finish with. Got two birds here. You got Julian and uh, Gabrielle. Julian's bad luck. Gabrielle's uh, good luck. Pat one on the head. Yeah. Whatever you want. You want a dose of bad luck or good luck? What do you reckon? I've got to think it'll be. Oh, Gab- oh. <laughs> there you go. Oh, somewhere you in between. Balanced in between. Life's good. Thanks, Life's good. Life is good. Thanks very much. I really enjoyed it. And uh, good luck to you guys, mate. This is unbelievable. Two legends. That two legends. Yeah, two legends. Do you I know what? That. Do you know what? The number of people who reached out to me and sent me what you wrote when you left Kyle and Jackie O. We actually had a Oh, when I retired the. You retired. Yeah, yeah. The number of people sent that to me, and then just out of the blue, I got an invitation to come. So that wasn't Matty Johns who got me in this. Cooper, Cooper, named after Cooper Cron, but Cooper Johns, that reason I come is because of you. Oh, I appreciate that. I'm real. Really? For real. I appreciate that. Thank yeah. you very much. What I'll do, boys, I'll just leave the room. Leave <laughs> you blokes with it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Good on you, You're Mark. <laughs> Thanks, mate. And there he goes. Mark, Br- what a what a great interview. How good is he? Great guy. Very, very, very impressive guy. You know, generationally, you're, you're a younger guy. What, what did what did you uh, what'd you take out of it? Very, very knowledgeable, obviously. Uh, but even just, I liked his take on modern stuff. Like a lot of, I loved his, I loved his chat with, about the porn star. At the very start. What surprised all the brilliant things he <laughs> had to talk about, finance, you know, he, his parents and what they sacrificed and all that, you know, the Kerry Packer stories. But you, all you were thinking about that whole interview was the porn star, the only fan star. It was interesting to hear about his parents, how hardworking they were. I was going to say it during it, but I, I was like, my thought process was just, you can tell why he's successful. Mm. If he's like, you can see the example that his parents set for him, the hard work, like those sort of values that he that he learned from them i i don't know coop i certainly don't know of a sponsor who's or someone who sponsored a rugby league side who was just loved so much by the players than when he was the sponsor of the new south Wales state of origin side as i said before it was you know he had the rings for the winning series but just the involvement of all the players helping the players out where he could and you can just see he's a great guy mm. terrific uh, is that when when was the first time you met him? It was through it was through Origin. I think it would have been uh, would have been early two thousands. Was when he mentioned the footy show. I was working on the footy show, and he would come on um, here and there. You weren't playing though then. No, you weren't. You I, I, I'd yeah. retired. Yeah, okay. I'd retired, but um, yeah, yeah, it, just just, just a, a, a really good guy. And I, and Mix, you know, like, I just love those Kerry Packer stories, and it's just it's millions of them. Yeah, so uh, he's yeah. very good. Well, Matthew, what a great podcast you do. You were very good. Oh my! <laughs> Thank and you know what, son, you're pretty good. Yeah. Uh, if you want to follow us uh, on Spotify podcast app and YouTube, our name is Backstage with Cooper and Maddie Johns. But on Instagram and TikTok, Backstage Cooper Maddie Johns. Okay. Yeah. Let's go. Right on. Till I'll buy you a beer. How old are you? Twenty-four. Okay. Perfect. Let's go. <laughs>